And when it comes to the cause of voicing for the unvoiced communities, it is an expression of fulfillment. With such academically and passionately fertile guests around, I, Shilpa Khatri, the moderator for today's event, feel privileged to have the honor to welcome our distinguished speakers and our involved participants to the seminar on Romani histories and prospects, what can we learn from a minority language and culture? This has been organized by the WIGDIS International Center on the occasion of UNESCO's World Day of Romani Language. As in the case of other ethnic minorities, Romani human rights have two principal dimensions. First, the protection of the right of Roma to have equal access to the opportunities that society offers to all its citizens. Second, the right to exercise control over a domain of cultural activities that are particular to the minority. In other words, the right of Roma to run their own cultural affairs and language is perhaps the most conspicuous of cultural assets which a minority may aspire to manage and develop on its own. The idea of the seminar today is to draw attention to successful practices and challenges when it comes to the preservation and promotion of the Romani language and culture, despite the centuries-long persecution and discrimination of Romani people. We will also discuss if and how the experiences of the biggest European minority community can be shared and transferred to other communities across the world. We will first have opening remarks by our hosts, then each of our distinguished speakers will have 15 to 20 minutes to present their perspectives, followed by a brief question and answer session. For the first opening remarks, I would like to invite the director of the WIGDIS International Center, Sofia Zahova, who has been consistently working on and for the Romani narratives, highlighting their vulnerabilities and through several forums, voicing for their rights for over two and a half decades now. Over to you, Sofia, please. Thank you, Shilpa G. Vericel oblesot, te ven sa steta i bachtalero malen, mistovilan tarealen. Warm welcome on my behalf to this seminar organized on the occasion of the World Day of the Romani Language that is celebrated on the 5th of November. It is one of the events that have been organized and hosted but by our Vigdis International Center in the framework of initiative that we have and is called Roma in the Center. It has been launched a couple of years ago with the support of the leadership of Stopnum Vigdis of Fimbogadotter as well as many colleagues and collaborators who are here with us today. The idea of the Roma in the Center initiative is on the one hand to provide a platform for Roma voices from academia and practice to share their narratives and perspective on Romani history and culture, unlike the very common pattern of either seeing Roma on the margins or analyzing Roma as a subject of study. Roma in the center thus sees Romani people as agents and owners of their own identity. On the other hand, we also wanted to bring individuals and discussions like this one in the center, meaning the physical building of Vigdis, the of very old the house of Vigdis, that is named after Vigdis Fimbogadotter, the UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador for Languages, um, because this is also a UNESCO center and house of languages and intercultural understanding. The establishment of the 5th of November as World Day of the Romani Language is actually uh, one really inspiring for me initiatives that exactly shows Romani agency coming from the grassroots up to a global level. Actually, on this date, in 2005, 
uh, there was a promotion of a Romani uh, Croatian dictionary in the capital of Zagreb, of, of Croatia. Um, and then this, um, this initiative beca- became a sort of inspiration for Roma and their non-Roma allies to petition um, the government of Croatia to support the idea of proclaiming it as a national day of the, Roma, of the Romani language, but also to start a diplomatic action talking to different missions and UNESCO for supporting them uh, and making this a world day of Romani language. So finally, uh, this day was proclaimed, and since 2015, uh, the 5th of November is celebrated as the World Day of the Romani Language. It is the second time that the center celebrates uh, the day in Iceland. We first marked this day in 2020, rather symbolically, with the release of the book Synodax Matur of Fleiris Yogur Roma Folks, that, is, um, uh, that can be shown here, and is the first Icelandic language book of uh, short stories authored by Roma people. This UNESCO Day is already part of the Vigdis International Center annual events calendar, and it is a great honor for me that our three guests accepted to be with us and share their own experiences, their achievements, but also the challenges that are seen in their work. Um, I very much look forward to your talks and to the discussion that will follow. Thank you once again for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Sofia. I would like to now invite Birna, Professor Emirata University of Iceland and member of the steering committee of the Global Task Force of the International Decade of Indigenous Languages 2022 to 32 to provide her opening remarks and present the first speaker, please, Birna. Good afternoon and welcome. I have been waiting decades to stand here before you and and do this introduction, and I am so honored. First, as Iceland's representative to the Global Task Force, the UNESCO Global Task Force, uh, I would like to welcome you again to this event, which is part of the Beauty Center's program to support the preservation, revitalization, and promotion of indigenous and minority languages. And I am, of course, especially delighted to welcome our three main distinguished guests and experts on the Romani language and culture. The Vigdi Center has two main foci in regard to IDIL, the international decade. One is to support the languages and cultures of the Arctic region, which doesn't come as a surprise to anyone. And the other is to promote and support research, discussion, and cultural expression in the language of the Romani people. This may come as a surprise to some, but we, of course, are fortunate enough to have our own expert here, and we have been delighted to work with her. But this is, of course, Sophia. Thank you, Sophia. Um, We have, for the last few years, uh, uh, maintained a robust program dedicated to the Romani language and the speakers through lectures, seminars, workshops, and cultural events. And then, in 2020, the first book ever uh, of uh, Romani short stories in, uh, in Icelandic, and it was a bestseller, and it's right there. Uh, and this, again, is largely due to the expertise of Sophia and hard work and effort uh, that we have been delighted to support. My own research area has been in contact linguistics, and I have been astonished at how the Romani language has been sustained through the centuries despite intense and continued contact with other languages. The preservation of the Romani, lang- uh, the Romani language seems to defy all the traditional criteria used to measure language vitality, such as governmental support, there hasn't been any or very little, uh, educational materials, dictionaries, defined speech communities, none of these exist, and yet we have the, a robust uh, group of speakers. Perhaps Icelanders, and now I'm going off here, bear with me. Perhaps Icelanders and the Romani people have in common the fact that their cultural expression has been through their languages. 
through storytelling and poetry rather than through artifacts and edifices. And this may have helped preserve the culture against all odds. Uh, the Roma program that uh, Sofia described came, uh, came into being during my tenure as the director of the Vitis Institute, but I had an ulterior motive for encouraging Sofia in her work. And this is because I was fortunate enough to have our first speaker, Ian Hancock, uh, as a mentor and teacher at the University of Texas uh, over 40 years ago. And he influenced my career profoundly. <laughs> Ian's vital work on behalf of the Romani people is well established, and he has been awarded an OBE for his advocacy. If I remember, I think we were reminiscing yesterday, I think you represented the UN, uh, or represented the Romani people and the UN. You had to take a sabbatical, which made, made us very sad, our, your students at the time. And this was, you were a very young man at the time. Uh, Ian's work, uh, on behalf of the Romani uh, people has been documented in the book Languages of, Res of Resistance, Ian Hancock's contribution to Romani studies, authored by uh, uh, Kuchukov, New, and Acton, and we were honored to host Christo Kuchukov here a couple of years ago. And this, of course, is in addition to his uh, own important publications. I googled sort of how many books and, and articles he has, and one site said 350 publications in four languages and uh, over 5,000 uh, library uh, holdings. Uh, Ian's work is always poignant, as he is himself, and he, never, he doesn't mince words. Read, for instance, The Pariah Syndrome, an account of gypsy slavery and persecution that came out in the late 80s. We are the Romani people, and my very favorite, danger, educated gypsy. In many ways, he is a dangerous, educated gypsy. <laughs> uh, Ian's scholarship really doesn't, and his advocacy doesn't really need uh, an introduction. But if you Google Ian, you will find, you will come across glowing testimonials from his former students about how he affected their lives and academic careers in significant and transformative ways. And I am one of those very, very lucky students. He was my first point of contact when I first started graduate school at the University of Texas in 1982. And I started out in foreign language education. During our first meeting, and this was actually during our first meeting, he said to me, you're from Iceland. Oh, you have to go back next summer? Well, not in this accent, of course, but you have to go back next summer. You have to document that Basque or French Icelandic contact language that there I need it. I'm compiling an atlas of contact languages. I'll find you funding. You could, it's, it can be an independent study. Well, he found the funding. I went, and I was hooked. That was it. No more education for me. Uh, that is not, <laughs> not foreign language education. So I transferred to linguistics, social linguistics, to be exact. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting a little personal here, but you please bear with me. <laughs> I took all his courses, and I wasn't alone. There was a little group, a fan club, that followed him around. Uh, I wrote my, own dis my dissertation on Icelandic heritage language in North America in contact with English, and I was so truly honored to have him on my dissertation committee. And I have spent my career examining Icelandic, Icelandic in contact with other languages, as have my students. And you can imagine Ian's multiple influence on knowledge production in linguistics over the years. In my four years at UT alone, there were five or six of us who pursued language contact studies because of his mentorship. You remember Keith Walters and Becky Brown, who are renowned linguists in these areas. Dear Ian, in some ways, supporting Romani studies at the center and having you here is a closing of a circle for me. So I'm very, truly proud and honored to finally be able to welcome Ian Hancock to Iceland, to the university, and to the Vigtis Center. Ian has affected Icelandic linguistics in ways we will never know. This makes him a true Íslandsvinur, which means a friend of Iceland. Te aves partalo, Janko. I invite you to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. 
Oh dear. <laughs> if I were to talk about how privileged I am to be here and to see old friends and to be actually able to walk around in Iceland, which has been a dream of mine, uh, then it would take all the time of my presentation. Um, so let me say quickly, thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, everybody uh, involved in today. And the topic is language and culture of uh, minority populations. And ours is certainly a minority population in terms of the world, although we are numerically quite large in Europe. There are more of us than there are Swedes, for example. But we're not all in one place. We are a diaspora people. Um, I'm not going to dwell on culture. I'm going to say what I have to say about language. Um, but if you were to know anything about our culture, if you leave Hollywood aside, which is kind of an enemy to us because it, it's presented us as gypsies um, in very odd ways, but if you knew us really, you would know that for us, the center of everything is family. Everything is family. And that's all I'm gonna say about our culture. When we look at the language, the language can tell us where we came from. And it had to tell us where we came from because we forgot ourselves where we came from. If that memory had survived, we would have been able to tell people who asked us, where are you from? And we'd say where we were from. So when we showed up in the West, between seven and eight hundred years ago, and they asked us that question, we really couldn't tell them because we had forgotten. It turns out that we hadn't completely forgotten. There were one or two uh, reports from that period of, uh, there was one surprisingly from Spain where a, a Romani person there was asked by, I think by a priest, where are you from? And he was able to say where we were from. But generally, that got lost. And so who we were was open game to everybody. And um, one of the labels that we got was Egyptians. That was handy. Um, it was outside Europe. It would account for not being white. Um, and. The average European had never met a, an Egyptian, so you could get away with it. And so that word, in many forms, um, gave rise to, uh, for example, this word gypsy, which comes from Egyptian. And then another name that was applied very early on uh, was tsigan, atsingan, and so on. It means roughly don't touch or keep away. Um, and uh, it, it was transferred from a nickname applied to a religious population, the Manichaeans, who were, as we are as a people, not inclined to let outsiders get too close, too intimate. And we picked up the nickname, the, the hands-off people. And that has given all sorts of other words for us, Tsigan and, and so on, Tsigoina. Uh, but these are words that don't belong to us. We call ourselves by different words. So when we arrived, they didn't know who we were, and there were all kinds of guesses, some of them extremely weird. We came from the moon, 
We came from inside the hollow earth. We were Jews. We were jungle people from Nubia. We were made up. That was a good one. We weren't a real people. We were made up of the criminal fringes of different European societies, and the language we spoke was a mixture of different European argot, criminal words, and so on, and all of these were wrong. And the breakthrough came, as the story goes, in 1760 in Leiden in the Netherlands, where there was a student from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He came from a Hungarian town called Győr. Um, and he was a, a theological student in Leiden, in Holland. And uh, one day he was sitting in the student union room, and there were three students from India sitting there. And so he went, I guess, and went and sat with them, and he's listening. And the story doesn't explain how it is that he could fit right in. Maybe they could all speak Dutch by then, I don't know. But he came from a wealthy family back in Hungary that employed Romani workmen. And he would sometimes sit with these people and picked up some of our language from these workmen. And then, back in Holland, he's sitting with these Indians who are discussing uh, something or other in their language, and he's recognizing words that are in Romani. And the account of this says that they were speaking Sanskrit. Well, they absolutely were not. They could have been speaking something like Hindi or even Urdu, but certainly not Sanskrit because that's an earlier kind of, of Indic. So he was curious. He asked them to give him a list of a thousand words in Ramani language, um, which he took back home and sat down with those workmen. And they, according to the account, understood every single one with ease. Well, that's nonsense too. Um, first of all, there aren't a thousand Indian words in the whole language. There's about 800, but as far as we know, not a thousand. Um, he didn't know what to do with this. He passed the information on to a friend who liked languages. Um, the friend said, oh, that's interesting, but he didn't do anything else with it. But 16 years later, in 1776, it ended up in the offices of the editor of the Vienna Gazette, German language uh, periodical. And in that issue in 1776, he put a little note with some comparative words saying, finally, the mystery is solved. These Sigoyna gypsies are Indians. And this is at a time when linguistics was starting to take shape. We're in the Enlightenment period. There's a lot of interest. New, new scientific disciplines are emerging. Uh, we get into the 1800s, and uh, the question comes up, OK, uh, they speak an Indian language, and the idea was, well, then they must be Indians. That, of course, is a silly assumption. There's no genetic connection between your language and your gene pool. Um, so, but they didn't consider that. They, they said, well, if, if they're from India, what are they doing here in, in Europe? And looking around, looking at uh, the Sigoyna, uh, did lowly jobs. A lot of them were musicians. And so one scholar, I'm not giving you all the names and so on, just to keep it short. Uh, but one scholar said, well, they, how they are in Europe and the things they do in Europe 
match the Domba people back in India, who are members of the lowest, uh, even, even lower than Shudra, but he said Shudra. Um, so this is who they are. Uh, what are they doing? OK, maybe that's who the ancestors of the Sigoyna were. Doesn't explain what they're doing in Europe. Well, they were musicians. They wandered into Europe somehow. And this notion of wandering is still part of the stereotype. Wandering is a luxury. Uh, our people have not wandered so much as have been made to move on by law. That's the truth of it. So to really speed it up, let me say what we, where we're at now with what we know about our origin. Coming back to language, one thing about the grammar, it has two genders, unlike Icelandic, which has three. Unlike Latin, unlike German, masculine, feminine, neuter, we only have masculine and feminine. But around the year 1000, Middle Indic was transitioning into New Indic or modern Indic and losing the neuter gender. Some of the earlier hypotheses about when we left India take the exodus way back, even to the fourth and fifth centuries. If that had been the case, we would have left India with a three-gender language. There are traces of three genders in another population out of India called the Dom, who live in the Middle East. And there are traces of three genders, which points to a, an earlier separate exodus out of India. And that's pretty much um, established uh, by uh, specialists today. But coming back to our language, it means, or we can start from the basis that we could not have left earlier than about 1,000. But then we showed up in, uh, at the gateway to the West, at least, um, in the middle of the 13th century, even earlier. So there's a little window in time that has to be explained how to get from India to Europe in this little time slot of a couple of hundred years. And so we look at the, back at the uh, vocabulary, the lexicon of the language, and if you, if you look at the Romani language and think of it as something like an onion, which is layer upon layer upon layer, the heart of the Romani onion is Indian. All our basic words, our numbers, all the basic stuff is Indic and most closely like Hindi, less so like Punjabi, even less so like uh, Bengali and, and so on. Um, so that kind of puts us in an area but the language also has words from other Indic language groups or dialect clusters. So we'll get, say, three different words for wash in Romani that come from three different Indian languages. Three different words for sing from three different Indian languages, suggesting speakers of different Indian languages somehow came together. If we look at the, the semantic area, we find very many words having to do with warfare, the words for the weapons, for spear and sword, and capture and uh, prisoner of war and so on. These are Indian words. These are words that have been in the language from day one. So then we look at the history books to see what sort of military activity is going on around the year 1000. And sure enough, we find that Mahmoud of Ghazni, uh, a leader of the Ghaznavid Empire, has begun a series of 
raids into northwest India over a period of almost a quarter of a century, 17 raids, most of which were victories for them, which is why that part now, Kashmir, Pakistan, so on, are, are Islamic today. The Indian response, and there was no single India, so we have different Indian kings, all of them protecting their turf, assembling troops to try to resist the Ghaznavids. They lost most of those conflicts. Those people were taken as prisoners. And it's important, historically, genetically, that they didn't just take the soldiers, they took the service providers, the camp followers as well, which then accounts for the female uh, component in the genetic history. Bring them out into what is today Afghanistan, to um, Ghazna, the, the town is still there on the map, it's not very big. Um, but they in turn were defeated by another Islamic people, the Seljuks. The Seljuks defeated the Ghaznavids, freed the Indian captives who were happy to join the Seljuks against their former captors. These Indians with the Seljuks then move and moving further northwest and defeat the kingdom of Armenia. By now we're looking at 1071 AD. So we're now at the eastern end of the Byzantine Empire, a Christian empire where the uh, main, Greek, uh, main official uh, language is Greek. Um, lot of, and, and this is where um, we started to coalesce into an actual people. The language, too, is taking shape. I, not long ago, I finally had my uh, DNA test done and I got the results back and I was very surprised to see that I had a bigger genetic component of Armenian than Romani. And I, I was at first flabbergasted because nobody had ever mentioned this, but then thinking about it, it makes sense because there was this move through Armenia and there are about 40 Armenian words in our language, including the word for Easter. So we can assume that this was the first contact with Christianity. But then the next biggest component lexically, other than Indic, is Greek. Language is full of Greek words. But then another Islamic population comes to move our ancestors once again, and the Ottoman Empire is created by pushing westwards through the Byzantine Empire. And the Ottomans didn't stop there. They moved on up into Europe. So up until um, the First World War, uh, there was Ottoman control in, in the Balkans of Europe. What happened to our ancestors? Well, some were able to move to up into Europe and keep going. There seems to have been three major waves across. Uh, the first wave obviously went the furthest, and their dialects are uh, distinctive. The Sinti Romani language is distinctively uh, first wave, um, but the biggest group now are those who came in on the third wave and uh, were either uh, contingents with the Turkish troops or were captives of the Turkish troops, we don't really know, but they were kept as property in what today is the country of Romania but in the principalities of Moldavia and Wallachia, um, they had lots to do, lots of work to do. They were made use of, they were 
made so much use of that some began to move on out into the rest of Europe. And what quickly happened was laws were introduced to make them property, i.e. slaves. And that population and their descendants have been there in what is Romania as slaves for over 500 years. The abolition came at about the same time as the abolition in the United States of African slavery, about the same time. And after that, those people got away, those who could, made for the closest foreign border. Some went east up into Russia, Ukraine. Others went west into Serbia and so on. And eventually uh, across the ocean. We have more uh, Roma in um, North and South America than people ever imagined. They're between three and four million, I would say, easily, uh, especially in Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, uh, United States, Canada a little bit. Um, but anyway, we are global. And coming back to the language, this is our transportable homeland. We don't have a country, but wherever we meet other Roma who can speak our language, we're together. And, and the language is the vehicle of our culture. So you know, because you speak the language, you know how to behave. Um, and if we lose the language, we've lost that as well. And it's precious to us. And I better stop right there, because I'm sure I've overshot my time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian, for this absolutely interesting discourse. And it was so involving that almost all of us lost track of time. Uh, now I invite uh, Sophia to present the next speaker, Fred uh, Taikon, and invite him for the talk, please. Thank you. So it will be really a very short presentation with a few highlights. Fred Taikon, as he will uh, probably mention, comes from a very famous family uh, of Johann Dimitri Taikon, and he is one of the few individuals that have gravity and authority in his own community, but also among Swedish institutions and Swedish public in general. The highlights that I have chosen to present are the following. He established the cultural association and magazine Eromani Glinda, translating, translation Romani Mirror, uh, which has been monitoring issues of discrimination, worked for the improvement of the life of Roma in Sweden, um, and promoted Romani culture in, uh, for the general public. He is a founder and main manager of the Five Folk Festivals, and also editor, translator, and publisher of most of the Romani books published in the recent years in Sweden. Since recently, he is also an author of a series of autobiographical picture books about his own childhood that are really, really wonderful editions. Fred's leadership was crucial in the establishment of the Roma Cultural Center in Stockholm in raising awareness amongst, among Swedish institutions about Romani people, uh, and the discrimination against them, violation of their human rights, anti-gypsism in general among all institutions. He was contributing greatly to establishing commemoration practices about the Romani Holocaust, among, especially among the young generations of Roma, but also raising this awareness ab uh, among the Swedish society. For, for his devoted work, Fred received many recognition awards and prizes, the most recent of which, uh, Raoul uh, Wallenberg Prize, was awarded to him in September this year. I would like to quote the official statement, just the centers of the committee. Fred Taikon uh, bears his Romani identity with pride, and through his commitment, he paved the way for other Roma, young and old, to do the same. In 2021, Fred was awarded another prestigious state recognition, the Golden Medal Illis Quorum. 
The story goes that when delivering his speech at the award ceremony, the then Prime Minister of Sweden, Stefan Löfven, stated that the best thing that Fred Tycon has done was to bring the Swedish state to court and he referred to the case uh, that Fred initiated to seek justice for the police illegal register listing Roma families, including their children, in 2013. Note, however, that not everyone who brings the Swedish police to court gets a medal. Um, so with this, I would like to uh, invite our dear friend, colleague, and really is inspiring author, activist, and a human being, Fred Taikon. Thank you very much. I don't know where to stand. Sometimes Wherever I, you feel I comfortable. You that, uh, I feel me a bit, little bit discriminated. <laughs> Why? Because the tables are always too hard. <laughs> That's why. It's, it's a joke. Uh, but um, <laughs> I think I can stand here. Uh, I am, um, first of all, I would like to thank, uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in a program as this, and uh, that is very close to my heart, namely the Roma language. I feel honored that Sofia, invited me to, our, to your beautiful country, Iceland, and I hope that I will have more opportunities to, revis uh, to revise it, that for us a medieval fairy tale country, really fairy tale country. Uh, yeah, I, it, it should be like that. Um, but first of all, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather, Johann Dimitri Teichel, was a great activist who already in the first tried to create a better position for the Roma in Sweden. He strove for the Roma to get housing, schools, and work. Grandfather worked as an informant at the Nordic Museum in Stockholm. There came the idea to create a dictionary in Kelderas, the book was completed long after his death by Eric Youngberg. You can see the book there. It's a very unique uh, dictionary. I, myself, grew up in the Roma settlement in Stockholm called Tanto. When my grandfather died in 1950, my father Eric his Romani name was Vosho, took over his work, and then my sister, who was two years older than me, and I. Means that the whole family, Taikon, has been working since early 30s to try to promote a better situation for the Roma in Sweden. My sister, Nadia, became one of the first Roma mother tongue teachers, and she was the first Roma woman in Sweden to start the Roma Women's Association. I went to work with human rights, and I also formed the Roman Association, a Roma de Glinda, as she, as she said, and you was making a very big presentation of me. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, also, and I also formed the Romani Association of Roman Glinda, which had a newspaper linked into the association. The newspaper covered news concerning Roma in Sweden and abroad. After I created the Roma Publishing House with the framework of the association of ERG, short way for Romani Glinda, which means that we were represented in various book fairs. I have a great interest 
in Romani language, which means that I have translated many different texts. In my activist life, I saw early on that where, uh, on, uh, that it were a lack of Romani teaching materials. That's why I decided to write about my childhood in Tanto. The books could become a supplement to the mother tongue teaching. The books are written in two languages, Swedish and Romani dialect. My own dialect, Kelderar. A loaded CD was also included with the books. In the publishing house, we started to create bilingual books. After the first Holocaust conference in Stockholm, my friend and brother, Ian Hancock, took the floor. I will just mention, I don't know if I had the time, yes, please. I just mentioned why he took the floor. Because it was the very first Holocaust conference in Sweden, started 2001, initiated by our prime minister. And we was invited, the Roma was invited, but they didn't have any time to speak. They didn't have the possibility to speak about the Roma Holocaust. We were not given. We were not given, so it's right. And then during those two days when the conference uh, was open, we was assembled, you remember, Ian, that we was assembled and all the Roma who was there was so nervous and we were speaking to each other very nervously. And then suddenly came a person from Czechia. Could you remember? Kumar. Yeah, Kumar. Uh, and he was the representative uh, from Czechia and his name was Kumar, but he had an uh, Indian heritage. So uh, he said, what is it? What is it about? And then we said, we don't have any place in the chair. We don't uh, have any chance to speak. And then he said, I will give you five minutes of my time. So he gave us five minutes on the time. And now we Roma who were standing there said, who shall we send up and who is the one who speaks best English? Oh, we have Ion here. So let's, let's put him up there. And he said, this is very long time ago. You know, Ion has also a Romani name. It's, it's very difficult for me to call him Ion when his name is Janko. So, uh, I remember the first, very first word you said. Never go out my head. I can nearly quote you exactly. Because you said, I heard from others that we are not represented because we don't have any country. It's only country who are represented, represented here in this big conference, but we don't have any country. That's why we are not represented. But I will tell you, just because of that, we should have time to the floor. I, that's, why, that's why I took uh, this picture, and you can see that we, in, in the meantime, we was having coffee in the break, we were speaking what to do. Um, back to my... Manus, Does it, is it the right name, Manus? Or how, what do you say, what do you call it? I'm sorry for my English. Um, I'm not, uh, I have to tell you, I'm not an academic person. I, I only had nine years uh, primary school. Um, and also, I haven't studied English in the school because in that time when I went to school, we didn't have the chance to study English. I learned, by the way. But, Eroma Neglinda began to manifest Holocaust Remembrance Day, January 27, annually. We have done it since the conference 2001 because we 
want, we don't want to be forgotten at the Holocaust matter. Edomna Glinda has also participated in creating commemorative trips uh, in the Roma Holocaust footprints. We have done this very long time now. So we take young people, young Roma people with us. Sometimes they are uh, between uh, 15 to 25 uh, young Roma together. You can see them out here. And also in Auschwitz-Birkenau, there is one special, uh, special Roma uh, museum. But that museum is not included in the Roma, in, in the guide tour when they are going guiding in Holocaust. Sometimes, in, in Birkenau. Sometimes, if people want to see the, the museum, uh, you have, they, the guide have to go and ask for the key to open it because it's not open. So, um, The, um, yes, that was also what I take the next picture, please. Uh, I was a part of investigation into a Holocaust museum in Sweden, which was inaugurated in uh, July this year. Uh, and Romani Glinda will be a partner in the museum, all to highlight the Roma, and that the Roma were also exposed to the murders of Roma and Jews by Hitler and his Nazism. All the information we uh, officially contribute through our uh, public events about language, culture, and about all music can all contribute to making it lesson for the other minorities and public, because as you said, we are highlighting the all five minorities three times a year in the biggest park in Stockholm. It's really a biggest park in Stockholm. So we have the opportunity to be there. And we have a big, uh, a big uh, uh, tent where we have tables for the five uh, minorities where they can put all the information about them. Because we went to, to the book fair for nearly 12 years ago, <coughs> sorry, and I was standing there like this, you know, outside and people was uh, passing us and I was standing with my, our paper, the Roman Glinda, and I was asking them, hello, uh, do you know anything about the Roma? No. Do you know anything about the national minorities? Yeah, I heard about them, but can you count those, which are they? And they was uh, saying, yeah, the Same and the Jews. But don't you know that the Roma also are one of the national minorities? No. But please come in here. And they was looking. So we was helping them. And then we discovered, because it wasn't just one person that we was asking, do you know anything of the minority? They didn't know nearly nothing. And that was 10 years after we became national minority. That means that the Swedes that in that time didn't know so much about it. That's why we started to make fivefold festival in Stockholm. So, uh, yeah, it's a bit I don't know, I'm sorry. Um, maybe I go a little too long, you it's know, so right. that's it's okay. Right. Um, uh, but uh, last year in 2021, as you mentioned it, I, I got rewarded with a gold medal. And uh, I feel me very proud that the prime minister gave it because normally is that the cultural minister is giving this medal in his or her office by the cultural department. It's very anonymous. There is one, there is one uh, photograph, as we have an excellent photograph here, who is taking and documented, but nothing more. But in this time, the prime minister, he said, we will change that. I will give the medal. So, and also I will give it in my residence in Stockholm. 
and uh, the cultural minister, Amanda Lynn, was together, so <laughs> she had also the chance to be that together. And we all, normally, there is a very small ceremony uh, by the cultural minister. Uh, they have some small, something small to eat, and they have a glass of champagne. But here, uh, it was a real dinner. So we had a dinner, and it was the state secretary, cultural minister, and there were other uh, high authorities who was there. And I felt me very proud. And I also asked them, <laughs> is it possible to, that I can bring one, some of my families with? Uh, yes. He said, Take, bring your family. And then I said, but uh, you don't know what you are saying. <laughs> But uh, I, I said, no, I will, ha I will have my uh, nearest family, my two, my two daughters and their husbands and my, my grandchildren. So anyway, it was very nice to be there uh, together. But also, as you was mentioned, in September, I became this year's laureate of the precious Rob Wallenberg Prize. Um, of course, it was quite, uh, how should I say, a public thing to get the, the, the gold medal. But it was more, how should I say, it was more publicity when I got the prize of Raoul Wallenberg. Thank you. Because it was so honorable the nomination and the reason why I got this prize was that I have been walking in Raoul Wallenberg's footstep. And that is very, for me, <laughs> you see, I get there. Uh, yes. uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, it was very, I was very proud to get that prize. And also, it's not, you know, um, you can see that you can see that what I'm holding. It's a it's a portfolio. It's his portfolio, as he was carrying all the documents, but in brass. So very heavy. It's solid brass. And also, I got the pin. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, you can see it there. And, uh, okay, I lost what I was going to say, but uh, uh, it was very honorable to get the prize, you know. And after that, when they was decided to give me the prize, it was very much newspapers, televisions, programs, video recording, uh, and so on, so I haven't been free for nearly each second week is something. So now when I'm coming home, there are newspaper waiting for making interviews and I'm so happy. And I also told my Roma that uh, it's not only me who get that prize, even the boat prize, the gold medal, because I couldn't imagine to do all this work by myself. It's impossible. I need other Roma together with me. And as I was, now I'm back where I was going to say, it's not only this brass portfolio that I got, because in the price is included with 100,000 crowns. Can you change it to? I really don't know the currency. It's a 1,000, 1,000 uh, Iceland is 800 crowns. So uh, let's say it's 10,000 euro, just about 10,000 euro. And Janko, we have seen that uh, when we are out on those uh, memorial trips, our young Roma, they always say, but Kako, Fred, Uncle Fred, look here. 
a full on sign on the walls here, but, and we can see they are speaking about the Jews, but they don't speak anything about the Roma. There is no sign of the Roma. We should do something about it. I, we have been in Poland just for four weeks ago. Now we have been in different places where we haven't been before. That's why I call it in the footstep of the Roma, <coughs> on the Roma Holocaust. So I decided that those money that I get from the prize is not that I'm going to put them in the pocket and have traveling money or vacation or something. I will donate the money to the new museum, the new Holocaust Museum in Stockholm. For what? I don't give them money to, to run the, the museum because they have money of their own, but those money, I will put them in the bank and let other Roma put more money in that account so we can do a memorial sign inside of the museum, because it's lack of, of uh, memorial things, placard, or anything who really say that the Roma was a victim of the Holocaust. And uh, we just had, uh, one and a half week ago, no, two weeks ago, uh, uh, an international Holocaust conference. And that was uh, why, be, uh, why, because we Roma, we have been complaining to the government, you are doing very much for the Jewish, and the Jewish are our brothers, but you haven't mentioned the Roma. So they had a two days big conference in Malmö the last year, and it was about anti-Semitism, you know that. So uh, the government said that, uh, okay, uh, we will do a conference in the frame of IRA. Maybe you heard about IRA. So I will stop here, and uh, I also hope that you will uh, have lots of questions, and I also hope that I can answer the questions. <laughs> so, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to be here in this very nice country and the city of Reykjavik. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Fred. Thank you so much, Fred. It was such a peaceful, overwhelming, and so involving a narrative. And uh, we, we actually were thinking as if it's like a storyline that's happening to all of us. So really kind of you, thank you. Uh, I once again invite Sophia to present the next speaker, Jana, and invite her for a talk, please. So Jana Horvatova is a historian and museologist, co-founder and current director of the Museum of Roma Culture in the Czech Republic. Her father, Karel Holomek, comes from one of the oldest Moravian Roma families and, one, and is also a pioneering activist in former Czechoslovakia and also was politically engaged um, uh, in Czechoslovakia, participating in uh, authority structures. He is the son of Tomasz Holomek, who was the first university educated Roma in the history of the Czech Republic. I will just briefly highlight uh, the academic work of Jana Horvatova because she would uh, speak on uh, about the museum. Her scholarly work um, 
is focused on the history of Roma in the first half of the uh, 20th century, but also she is uh, looking into the historical data about uh, Roma who came to the Czech lands in the 17th century and who became the subject of Nazi genocide during the Second World War. She uses classical historical methods, but also the method of oral history. She also lectures on history, spiritual, and material culture of the Roma and published uh, many publications. Uh, I will mention only uh, the monographs, chapters from the history of Roma, uh, published in Prague, and uh, the testimony of old postcards that was published uh, in Poprad. Uh, also, Jana uh, has curated many of the exhibitions in the Roma Culture Museum that she will be going to present. Uh, and she is editor of many collections of historical materials that are annotated uh, and put in historical context. And for me, uh, one of the most impressive actually is uh, one of the recent ones. It's a volume published this year and it's 800 uh, page uh, uh, book uh, with memories and testimonies of Romani people who are survivors of the Second World War uh, entitled It is Not uh, Easy to Talk About It. Um, with this I would like to invite uh, Jana Horvatova to, uh, to give a presentation of this, imp of the really impressive work. And I forgot to write down, but I will now mention it. Uh, it is the, what has been achieved there uh, is really, could be a source of pride for any kind of, uh, pardon, um, any, any kind of institution uh, that is uh, a historical, uh, deals with historical heritage. Uh, but this is the only, globally, the only Roma museum that is a state-funded institution. Uh, that shows actually its importance, but also the hard work of Jana and her collaborators. Okay, thanks, I will just... Kevin, it will be yeah. automatically yeah, a presentation. I, yeah. That's why I, I just... Read. Thank you very much for invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, I have prepared my uh, speech and I will, I will uh, write this. Uh, Museum of Romani Culture, a state subsidized organization, Czech Republic. The first part, the beginnings, the establishment of the museum. After the Velvet Revolution in November 1989, Almost of all the new, newly formed Roma subjects at that time, political parties were asking for the establishment of their own museum. The museum was established in spring 1991 on the initiative of a small group of Roma intelligentsia in the Moravian city of Brno. A historian, Jana Horvátová, it's me, was lucky enough to be a part of a group of four people who were building the museum from scratch. The museum was established in a very good time of euphoria after the fall of communism. At the time, the public was curious about the unknown phenomenon of the Roma. The goal of the former communist state was to assimilate them and the politics of forced assimilation did not favor the memory of Roma history and their culture. The Museum of Romani Culture continues in the legacy of the first Roma organization in the Czechoslovakia, the Union of Gypsies Roma. It existed from 1969 to 73. It came into being at the time of a visible release of the communist pressure after the Prague Spring of 1968. After the invasion of the Soviet army, followed by a suppression of the democratic process, the Union was dissolved by the newly formed leadership of the Communist Party. The Union planned to establish the Museum of Romani Culture, and it was even creating museum collections. After the dissolution, these collections were given to the state, naturally a non-Roma museum. It was the Moravian Regional Museum, city of Brno. 
three out of four founders striving for the establishment of the Museum of Romani Culture used to be members of the Union of Gypsies Roma. The Museum of, uh, Museum of Romani Culture was established in April 1991 as a civic association, a non-governmental organization. Our efforts to create a state museum, which is subsidized by the state, proved to be at time unreal. The Museum of Romani Culture was from the beginning a specialized apolitical institution despite the efforts of a strong political Roma party, it was the name Romska Občanska Iniciativa, to keep control over the newly established museum. The founders of the Museum of Romani Culture managed to keep its independence so necessary, so necessary for an objective documentary work of a memorial institution that our museum was always supposed to be. The museum was in its first phase until the end, uh, until the end of 2004, financed from more sources through different grants. Apart from the state that supported the museum within the regional and national cultural and education in the languages of national minority support, it was the Open Society Fund or the Civil Society Development Foundation that funded the museum. Thanks to our cooperation with the House of Anna Frank in Amsterdam in the field of Holocaust education and research, one of our supporters was also government of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. The initial activities of the museum took place on provisional premises of a rented office that served as a study room and a future depository of museum collections. The space grew bigger to two, then three, and finally four offices. Museum collections were compiled and formed thanks to field trips, but very soon there was a lack, lack of space for their, depo their deposition. In 1998, we rented a small family house and established a separate depository. The space for exhibition was, however, non-sufficient. Second part. The museum's mission. The museum mission has remained the same since the establishment of the museum, to document as globally as possible the history and culture of the Roma as a world ethnic group. We started with presentation and exhibition activities in the second year of the museum's existence. Every time, however, we had to find a suitable place for the exhibition. Third, part permanent museum building. Apart from exhibitions, employees of the museum were giving a lot of lectures. They were taking care of damages caused by the persecution during the Second World War. They were giving consultations on the newly published textbooks, organizing concerts and participating in, in the preparation of Roma festivals. The state noticed the activities of the small NGO and supported the results of its work. It provided the museum with a permanent building. It donated, it donated around 36 million Czech crowns to finance the reconstruction of one of the damaged de derelict houses in the center of an excluded Roma locality in the city of Brno. Towards the, towards the end of 2000, the museum moved to its permanent building. In 2004, the museum started to continuously display temporary exhibitions. Fourth part, the breakthrough of 2005. After moving to a five floor building where maintenance was too expensive, it started to be clear that financing through grants was not, was not sufficient. Negotiations about the possibility to bring the museum under the care of the state started. On 1st of January 2005, the Museum of Romani Culture, as a state subsidized organization, was established. The institute was the Ministry of Culture of the Czech Republic. The museum fell under specialized memorial institutions, museums, and galleries, those with statewide competence. 
the most important cultural institutions. The number of professional, prof, professional full-time employees rose to 23. The collection and research activities expanded and the quality of exhibitions rose. The quality of deposition of collections also rose. They were now stored in specialized air-conditioned space. Fifth part, permanent exhibition called the story of the Roma. Thanks to the financial support of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, the first part of the permanent exhibition was opened in 2005. It was two halls about the post-war period. In 2006, a hall about the Holocaust of the Roma was opened, thanks to the support of International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IRA, a member of which the museum became in 2002. In 2011, in the framework of the celebration of 20 years of the museum's existence, the whole permanent exhibition was open to the public. It spreads on 351 square meters and covers one floor of the, our building. The story of the Roma from their departure from India to the present time is presented in six halls. The museum offers 10 exhibitions to land also, traveling exhibition maybe. Our annual average number of visitors, including visitors to the exhibitions and events outside the museum building, is around 30,000 visitors per year. Six part. There are approximately 30,000 collections items in 12 collection fonts. It is fund about documentation, craft, profession, professions and employment, interior equipment, textile, jewelry and valuables, poster and invitation, written material like manuscripts or documents, visual arts, reception of Roma culture in the mainstream culture, collections of photographs, videos and audio documentation, and self-documentation of the museum. The museum employs a professional video documentarist. Apart from field records, it also produces documentary films, especially for the authorial exhibitions in the museum. At present, it is the practice in our museum to create a short film for visitors for each temporary exhibition. Seventh part, storing the collections, depositories. The museum has so far six depositories where special conditions are maintained based on the type and material of the, deposi of the deposited collections. Currently, we have a marked lack of space for storing collections, the work of employees and holding exhibitions too. Eighth part, library and reading room. Libraries are accessible to public for free as regards lending on the spot and free access to the internet. The library collection includes original, original Roma and Romani studies literature as well as various Roma word periodicals. In total, it is about 10,000 volumes. Since 2010, there has been an e-catalog and an automatic lending system accessible via the website of the museum. Ninth part, publication of literature, audio and video. Since 1992, a yearbook with Roma studies topics has been published, a built-in of the Museum of Romani Culture. Since 2012, the built-in has been published as a professional peer-reviewed journal in Romani studies, an e-book on the museum's website. Today, it is a large publication of 150 pages. We publish our own book titles too, the anthology, Rich Soul in Romani language, uh, in Romani language, Chalo Vodi, has been subject to exceptional professional reviews. Gradually, we publish our collections in the form of catalogs. So far, catalogs of the following collections have been published. Visual arts, textile and jewelry, crafts, professions and employment, and a catalog of posters and invitations. 
This year we prepared the catalog of collections of photographs, the historical postcards with aromatopic. We have also released a CD with traditional Roma music from Czechoslovakia. The name is Gila Dila Gilora. It was published 2002. And a CD with the Holocaust, Holocaust subject matter songs, they are painful memories, which complements our anonymous film about the Roma Holocaust, a DVD. Last year, we published the anonymous book with the testimonies of Romani witnesses to the period before the World War II and during the war in the territory of the protectorate Bemen und Mern. All the items are available in our e-shop on our website. Tenth part, educational activities. The museum welcomes both non-Roma and Roma visitors. The motto of the museum is as follows. I quote, we are a space for meeting cultures. We are opening up paths to the roots of Romani identity. We preserve the culture and history of Romani people and make it accessible as a component of the heritage of the world. We are contributing to tolerance and mutual understanding for cultural dialogue for us. End of quotation. A strong impulse to establish the museum was a fear of an irreversible extinction of the unique Roma culture and an effort to rescue its remnants. By collecting the treasures, we wanted to give the Roma, give the, Roma the possibility to learn about their fortune and to find a way to a lost self-confidence. On the other hand, we want to improve the knowledge of the Roma culture and history for the non-Roma, to present the feared Roma world and to, sh and to show that the Roma culture, culture does not go against other cultures, but is their integral part. A missing piece, a missing piece in the world mosaic. We want to change the scary stereotypes into historically supported knowledge that builds roads from misunderstandings. Our focus on education of children and school age youth is above standard. That is why we employ three of four educators and two custodians. There are school excursions coming to the exhibitions and our educators revive them by means of animations and games according to the age of the children. One or two classes visit the museum every day. Apart from schools, we also have programs for a wide segment of visitors. Eleventh part, Romani language in exhibition, in exhibition activity of the museum. We can say that it that it is the museum's effort to somehow present the Romani language to the public. The main title of the exhibition is very often in Romani language, and the second title, a subtitle, is in Czech. The English version of the text has been a common standard for all our exhibitions in recent years. Examples of the names of our exhibitions were already given in the presentation, I, I, I can say um, one choose of them. Kalipuf Parnomaro, it means the black soul, soil, white bread. Chalovodi, rich soul, about Roma literature and about Roma writers. Manush Andrea Mende, how human, human we are, about Christmas in the Romani family. Or Siklardi Buti Somna Kunibuti, crafts of our ancestors. For example, in our new exhibition of visual art by Romani authors in Prague, the main name of the exhibition in Romani language is Pundrado Drom, the road is open. The exhibition texts are only in Czech and English, but in the exhibition they, they are also recorded in Romani language with interviews with the artists, which are shown on TV, and there are subtitles in Czech and English. In fact, Translations, all of exhibition text into Romani are never part of our exhibitions, mainly due to the more complicated situation with the use of different dialects of Romani by different Romani groups and also 
due to lack of space for exhibitions. However, what we pay attention to is that, at least on a symbolic level, the Romani language represented, represented even as a summary of the exhibition text or translation of selected important parts. In our prepared permanent exhibition at the memorial in Leti by Pisek, entitled Place of Memory, Memory of Place, we have this plan. Romani language will, will be part, will be one of the language mutations of, the, of text and labels in the basic pillars of the permanent exhibition in Leti, where explanatory text and, and labels will be in Czech, English, nor Central Romani dialect, it's dialect in our country, in Slovak and Czech Republic, and an internationally understandable, understandable variety of Romani language. The rest of the exhibition text is in Czech and will be in Czech and English. Audio story. This year, the museum is preparing, is preparing to publish an audio story from the works of Romani writers. We were trying to answer the question of how to make Romani literature more accessible to the younger generation. Native speakers, as well as prominent Czech actors and the famous and successful young actor of Roma origin, Jan Cina, are involved in the reading of the stories. We selected 11 short stories and as, bon as a bonus, four poems. So we have 15 tracks in Czech and 14 tracks in Romani language. One story, one short story was only in Czech. We want to have everything freely available on our website for download. The first audio stories will be published on the museum's website and social networks on November 5, the International Day of the Romani Language. Twelfth part, new opportunities for the museum. Since its establishment, the museum focuses on the topic of Roma genocide during the World War II. In the beginning, it mainly involved recording testimonies of survivors of the racial persecution. Since 1995, the museum has held annual memorial services at the site of the protectorate so-called gypsy camp in Hodonin by Kunstadt, which is the Moravian version of the Leti by Pisek. Also, Leti are better known in the media. Since 2018, both memorials have been managed by the Museum of Romani Culture. In Hodonin by Kunstadt, the museum runs a memorial of Holocaust, Roma and Sinti in Moravia. Last year, museum opened here a permanent exhibition, one part in a new building of visitor center, second in historical prisoners' barrack. Near the memorial is an emergency mass cemetery for the victims of the camp, which is also, also in the care of the museum. This memorial in Hodonin has become the museum's first isolated or detached workplace. The second isolated workplace has become Leti by Pisek. It is a place of mass graves of the victims of the protectorate above mentioned so so-called gypsy camp in Leti. In 1995, due to the interest of the Václav Havel's presidential office, a memorial dedicated to the Roma victims by the sculpture Zdeněk Hula was, was unveiled there. Museum also took over the premises of a pig fattening farm in Leti, which is situated on the place of the original protectorate concentration camp. Here, with the support of state funding, we are providing the demolition of pig farm this year, and with support of the Norway grants, the memorial itself will be built. The opening is planned for two next year, 23 or 24. We are building the third isolated workplace and fourth workplace of the museum in Prague as well, respectively with support of Norway funds. Center of Roma and Sinti. It is the name of this new workplace. This workplace will be a specialized workplace of the museum with direct connection 
to the Memorial in Letty and Holocaust of the Roma and Sinti, Information Center for the Public. Its opening is planned for next year. But the museum currently lacks a significant amount of funding, both for the completion of the Prague War Place and for the Memorial in Letty. Everything is in the process and for, for our team now of 35 employees, it means a long-term great workload. At the beginning of the museum, we never thought how hard it would be, but we see that our work makes grand and huge sense that keep us afloat. Thank you for your understanding. Thank you, Jonah, and uh, congratulations for the brilliant work and the efforts that you're putting in uh, to revive this minority community. Uh, well, Romani is a transnational language and therefore like the conscious conclave of the efforts which took place today here, we must continue to embark on a course of transnational cooperation and collaborative efforts for forming an organic network that will inspire and support. One of the most immediate tasks is to nourish the development and expansion of Romani literacy, ensuring that the language is disentangled from ideological alliances. Literacy must be viewed as a space that's open to negotiation between the participants in the communicative interaction a space that the participants are able to claim and shape as their own. With these words and thoughts, I open the floor for questions, please. Any thought, any question which you would like to put across to any of the three speakers, you're most welcome. Yes, please. Uh, uh, about the language and the, maybe the degree of standardization that you have, because you were talking about some of the dialects that you have in the, in the museum and the internationally understandable uh, variety. So to, to what degree are they standardized? And, and to what degree can you understand each other across the different dialects? Uh, may I request the speakers to please? Yeah, uh, it'll be nice if all three of you could actually come and take the space here. Um, Jan? You could take this one. There Jan? are a great many dialects, at least 60 have been counted. Um, uh, the, the core of the language is the same with different pronunciations of the same word, but after our ancestors crossed over into Europe and started to go off in different directions, then newer words had to be adopted for newly encountered concepts. Uh, we didn't, they didn't leave India with a word for computer, obviously but we need a word. When we meet at functions and talk to each other in our own language, depending on how close the dialects are, it's usually no problem at all. But sometimes the differences can be so great that we have to switch to a different language that we know. I was at a conference somewhere once where there were a lot of uh, Ramanis there from a lot of different places, but we had to switch to English so everybody could join in. Efforts to create a standardized dialect, and I was interested to see on one of your slides in local Romani and in a one that everybody can understand. That's what we're trying for. Obviously, for 
the vast majority of the millions of Romani people who speak Romani, standardizing the language is not even a priority. Their priorities are food, safety, health, and so on. Um, so the standardization projects, and there are two or three of them, um, really belong more uh, to dilettanti, even like hobbyists. Um, one, one effort came up with a new alphabet with strange characters, um, filling the gaps we need by going back to Sanskrit. That really doesn't work. It would make more sense to go to, let's say, Hindi, because Hindi has gone through the time changes that Ramani has. Um, so it would be like um, fixing up French by bringing Latin words in. Um, so that's, uh, that didn't work. What I would like to see is replacing the foreign words with words from our own language if we don't have them in our, lang in our dialect, maybe that dialect still does. I'll give you one example. Um, in in Kaldarash Ramani, which is the biggest one, the, the, the word pen, or the root pen, means both say and tell. But we have a word for tell, which is pukar, may pukarau, but it's not used, as far as I know, in Kaldarash. But in my family's dialect, it, it existed. Why not bring that into the international dialect? Um, and yesterday we talked about the word for tree. Uh, where I live, the, the speakers use the word for wood, or else a Romanian word for tree. But we have a word for tree in other dialects, which is a good old Indian word. It is ruk. But still, it's an academic exercise to create such a dialect. The real thing is to get it to the people. And that means schools, and that means money. And uh, I'm sure you've got something to add, and you've got something to add. <coughs> Uh, of course, there are some different in the dialects. Uh, you, you, you mentioned the tree as a rook. Mm. For us, Kelderers, rook is the branch. Branch. Uh, yeah. uh, a bit of a tree. Yeah, a bit of a tree. <laughs> and a bit of a tree, it's growing other ones. What do you call them? Yeah. Krianga, but Krianga. that's a Romanian word. Krianga. Yeah, Krianga. Uh, so, uh, I would like to ask you, have you ever heard how it sounds when we are speaking Romanis? David Bachtalo, Janko, Sarma Bushro, Sarma Bushes, Kai Bushes, and this is our team. Mishto, Mishto Albumor team, or Travel Cotis Shukar. Carly Bachtalo and the Giro team, and the America, Teddy Cows, and Bushes, and the Hosting. Tu mangas ta ta ves a mende? Eu não mangas tu faz tal. Cana, se tu lo ve? Não, eu lo ve. Se te mangar o pebuli, se a tu lo ve. Então, that is the way we are speaking. We are speaking different dialects from the beginning. I am the Kelderas, and you are the Pashando. Yeah, and as as he also said that we have some Romanian citizens here, and we was joking. Uh, for a few days ago, when we were speaking, we, me, me and Jaco, we were speaking Romanes to each other, and Adriana was sitting next to us in the car, and she said, but uh, this is a Romanian word. Yes, it is a Romanian word. That means that our Kelderas, my Kelderas, I don't lie if I said that it is between 35 and 40 percent Romanian word in, in our dialect. Yes. I will give you an example. 
I was um, in Romania for three weeks ago, and then uh, I went to, uh, to uh, Roma school class, and I was showing our Romani books, my books. And uh, I was reading for them, all of the books. The thing was that the Roma children, they didn't know Romanes. Mm. They couldn't speak Romanes. But I wrote anyway, and I asked him, did you understand something of what I was reading? Yeah, some. But you said you, did, you don't speak Romanes. And I know why you understood something. Because it was Romanian words. That's why you, why you was understanding. But others, they didn't understand anything. And also about the dialects. Some of the dialects, as you said, are so far away, so far from each other. So we take uh, the, the Keldarash and the Lovara and some of the other dialects. Uh, Churar. Churara. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are cousin to each other. It's near, uh, as we said, in Sweden. Uh, we are between <laughs> Denmark and Norway. So those dialects are so near as uh, Sweden can understand Norwegian. Then it starts to go to Denmark, it's more difficult. Then it's go to Germany, it's more difficult. So there are dialects who are so far away from each other, from just about from Swedish to France. Because if you don't know any other language, if you don't know France, you don't understand nothing. So for me, it's very difficult to understand Arli. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, the thing is also, uh, I have been here now for three days, and uh, I have heard Icelanders speaking, but I don't understand nothing. <laughs> but I've been walking today to shopping a little bit, and I understand all the text, what it stands. Uh, uh, what they have on the menu, what they have uh, to sell, and so on. That means that I don't understand when I hear, for example, uh, Arli. But when I see the text, much easier. It's like that with Dutch. I can understand Dutch when it's written, but when they start speaking, forget it. <laughs> and uh, what do you say, Anka? Uh, maybe uh, <laughs> I would like to say a little bit about Czech Republic and the situation with the Romani language. Uh, most of Roma population in Czech Republic are Roma from subethnic group Slovak Roma from Slovakia. But they went to the Czech Republic uh, after Second World War. In Czech, Czech Republic uh, now lived uh, only remnants of originally Czech uh, Roma, but they were murdered uh, be, uh, in time of the Second World War. And this Czech, uh, Czech Roma had a special dialect, but this dialect now is uh, lost. Mm. And Slovak Roma, it's uh, about 90% of Roma population in Czech Republic are Slovak Roma, and they speak with North Central dialect. And this dialect is no, is uh, other, other language than international understandable mm -hmm. language, which is uh, uh, similar Kaldarar dialect, I think. And in Czech Republic live Olach Roma too, because Kalderash Roma are uh, from the groups of uh, Olach Roma, but in Czech Republic live Lovara Roma. Mm -hmm. They um, typical uh, crafts was uh, uh, horse trade. Tra they were horse traders, and it is other dialect. Uh, that is problem uh, in our exhibition that uh, we we uh, choose the dialect of uh, most of our Roma, but this dialect is not uh, good understandable for international Roma. When, when we, those of us from different dialect groups who, who that do not speak the kind of Romani you're describing, like uh, Lovari and Machvaya and Kildarasha and so on, learn, I had to learn 
uh, Fred's dialect because he speaks the kind of Romani that first of all has the most speakers of any dialect and second of all is found all around the world. Most American Roma, nearly a million, speak Kaldarash or a dialect very similar to it. In South America, it's the same thing. So uh, a lot of uh, Romani leaders, uh, uh, particularly those who came from Hungary and spoke uh, my kind of Romani, um, had to learn also Kaldarash to be able to talk to uh, a wider audience. But in a couple of countries, I should say this quickly, the language has been forbidden. This happened in Spain, it happened in Hungary, and, and in Britain, and Finland. So what is left is the local language, which instead of, let's say, English words, has Romani words in it. So if I were to say something like this, um, and it's called, in England, it's called Poggedy. I was born in England. It's called Poggedy, which is how, how they say broken. Um, uh, if I wanted to say, look at the girl in the house, I would say, dick at the chai in the care, right? So it's English, but the words have been changed. But it's spoken very quickly. If you only know English, you, you wouldn't understand. And it, more than anything, has the power of being an ethnolect. It's still a part of your whole identity, even though it's not grammatically real Romani. Um, it serves its, its social purpose. Yeah. Um, uh, and I would like to say a little bit more about um, uh, the situation in Czech Republic because uh, North Central dialect was a little bit codificated by uh, Milena Hipšmanová, like establisher of Romani studies in Czech Republic, like um, scientific branch at the university. And in the 70s, she codificated our dialect. It is now good situation, and uh, we have uh, in uh, our capital city in Prague, publisher house care, it means uh, in Romani language house, and this is publisher house is very good, and uh, now um, uh, it's several uh, several title, titles of book in Romani language and in Czech, it's very, very good book, and Sofia has some of the, them, or all, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, care, uh, you can see uh, their website, uh, K-H-E-R, Care Publishing House. Thank you. Yeah, that, that is uh, something we brought from India, is the difference between a K and a K. Because if you say care, it's a house. But if you say care, it means do, do it. <laughs> that also depends how you speak. Yeah, you have to put an H. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, because uh, care, for example, uh, if you don't pronounce it right, means a, uh, a boot. And uh, in Hindi, what? Ghar. Yes, very close. But uh, I am, uh, maybe I start a discussion here. But, uh, can, can we? <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt okay. you. Okay, you wasn't finished. I wanted, to, no, I did finish, but then something struck me okay. to do our party trick, yes. okay. <laughs> when I give talks, I ask, are there any people from India here, or are there any people here who speak Hindi? And there usually is somebody. And I do a little comparison of our <laughs> words. So if I say the Ramani word, will you say the Hindi word? Okay. Yek, dui, trin, star, panch. Ek, do, pi, char, panch. Nak, Nak. Kan. Kan. Tan. 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 Bal. Bal. Okay, enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Do you have any Greek speaking person here? There's one. Oh, there is one over there. Kalimera. Uh, <laughs> hello. Um, 
If I say Mia, what does it mean? And uh, if I say Efta uh, Ochto Seven, eight, nine. If I say uh, Sarma. Sarma. It's Duma, Duma, it's another yeah. word. But you know, it, it's also, we have... Uh, Ask about Lundi. Ah, Lundi, but uh, and, and also there is a uh, uh, Kokala. Yes, bones. It's bones and so on. So, you see, we have lots of words from other countries. Mm. Mm. And also, as I was going to say, maybe I'll start a discussion with you. Okay. Because... Uh, uh, it exists nearly each 10 year in waves comes uh, um, language conferences in different places. And uh, people want to make standard of our language, doesn't they? Mm -hmm. And uh, we had the last, uh, uh, I think it was in Sweden, the last one, conference and uh, they said, we want to make a standard language for, uh, for the Roma. And then I asked them, but which dialect will be the standard? Your dialect, friend, because your dialect is the biggest one. Oh, how lucky I am, because I don't have to study another language. But what about the other? languages who have to start again to, to, to learn another language. I got it free, but so many other languages have to, to learn it. But also I can say, as you said before, Yanko, uh, we do have a conference language because um, Sometimes when we are in international Roma conferences, uh, we have boxes for translation. translation. And some of the translators, they know how to say different kind of words where, we, where it suits the, uh, the other uh, groups also. So I would say there is a conference language as we can use sometimes. And then also, as you said, that. Uh, uh, we also use English in our conferences, but then we have uh, people who are translating. It's, it, it makes sense to take Calderas or Lovaritska, one of those, mm -hmm. as a base. But, as you said, and as in your grandfather's dictionary, 40% of the vocabulary is Romanian. Yeah. And for uh, dialects that were not influenced by Romanian, that means 40% of your words don't mean anything to speakers of the other dialects. So getting rid of the adoptions, I don't ever call them loan words because they're not on loan. They've been adopted and kept. Um, we have to get rid of some of those. Some of them obviously have become universal, like televisia, computeri, words like that. There's no reason to get rid of those. But little words, I mean, we've got in, in, in Vlach, we've got shukar, but we also have mundro, right? Let's get rid of mundro. Nobody else understands that. Um, but I, it's kind of, wishful thinking that this is going to happen anytime soon. But also, uh, Janko, it, because there is, our language is a very old language, so we don't have the modern words. Right. For example, if, uh, I don't know what you call it in, in England or America, the, the, the car who is uh, for, for fire. Oh, the fire engine. Yes. The, no, I mean, they are the, the firefighters and they have a car when they are out. Well, the hose? No, not the hose, the car. The oh, car. The, the fire engine machine fire, that you yes. drive. Yeah. Oh. There is no word for that in Romanes. Of course not, because it's a new word. 
Yeah, it's, it's new in English too, <laughs> right? Fire engine. But, uh, we, we in Sweden, uh, for that car is Brandbil. Maybe you understand what I mean, Brandbil. Uh, but we don't have the uh, name of that. But we have a lot of uh, metaphors in Romani. Um, Gojaver Lava. Gojaver Lava, Pura Romanda, yeah, that, for example. That, um, like, for example, the word, the word that people use for the, the muscle, the calf muscle, is matro, which really means fish. But if you look at the shape of it, that muscle is kind of like a fish. Um, we, we use a word, uh, at least in America, for the internet, which is drakin, or drakalin. A drak means a grape. And in Romani, to make the tree that a fruit grows on, you put in on the end. So, uh, or lin, in or lin. So, like apple is pabai. An apple tree would be pabalin. And a drakin is a grape vine. And that is kind of a metaphor for the internet. You know, you hear it through the grapevine, and that caught on pretty well. Um, and we could do that. Yes. Yeah. And, and Janka, I, I would like to ask you for... Uh, <laughs> okay. There's more okay. questions, I'm sure. Uh, we'll take yeah, it up question take time. Question. Take the question. Yeah, I was just wondering whether in, you know, at any time in sort of the, in the past or whatever that, that lingua francas have been, or contact languages have been created between the different varieties of, of Romani. I have a very good example of that. Because in Sweden we have a program in the Swedish radio, national radio, called Radio Romano. And, uh, in Sweden, we are speaking at least 15, 16 dialects because of, there are so many different Roma in Sweden in this moment. So, and we, all, we also have uh, uh, 50, uh, 30, uh, 30 minutes uh, in that radio. That means that uh, they have to cover all the other dialects. So they, they use, I mean, they start to use a kind of a lingua franca. So try to understand that to, uh, other people and other don't understand what they are saying. Uh, but there is one dialect uh, that I completely don't understand when they are speaking there. Uh, it's uh, um, Polska Roma. I don't understand it. Uh, but uh, it's not so many interviews of that. But they are using Kochatowski. Kind of yeah. This man. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, the three of you have been doing so much uh, to nurture this uh, the, the Roma culture and, and the language but in three very diverse places. And uh, I would like to hear something about your experience uh, with the younger generation. And when the younger generation is willing to maintain it and work on it and uh, develop, develop it in, in general. Um, and if I may you. just add something about the long on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, if you allow me to, yeah. Yeah, it's quite difficult to, um, of course, there are many young children and kids who don't know how to speak Romanese. And uh, in Sweden, as we are a national minority, they have the right to learn their mother tongue and different Romani dialects, of course. So I can't go out and teaching an early kid uh, Keldarash. It has to be one early person who is doing it. And what's the but situation? There, Sorry. But also, there are some parents 
who don't want their kids to go to these mother tongues teaching. Because they say, what shall he do with that? Does he got any job if he knows to speak Romanesque, to read and write? And he learned Romanesque from me. My, I am the mother. So he learned from me. So they don't put the children as often as the, the Lovara and the Kelderas in the monitoring teaching school. Do you have something to add? Um, in Czech Republic is a problem that it was a country under a communist regime, 40 years. And the communist regime has own plan with gypsies. They, uh, they would like uh, assimilate it Roma. Uh, and plan bill, uh, and plan was uh, lost their culture and uh, language too. The Roma children um, uh, in the school uh, was uh, forbidden use uh, Roma language, and parents. Uh, it was uh, uh, it was very often that uh, Roma per, per parents uh, don't uh, learn their children Romani language. It was uh, it was uh, in my family too. Uh, and uh, now I am mm, very regret that I that the Romani language is not my native uh, language, and I can't uh, learn uh, Romani language. But uh, I am not good in <laughs> this because it's very, very, uh, very hard language, very, very difficult. And uh, situation with uh, Romani language in Czech, uh, in Czech Republic is not good because the children lost uh, their own language and uh, can't speak, can't speak Romani. Uh, but we have uh, at the university, at the Charles University, special branch for Romani studies. There are, there are students, they learn Romani language, and we have Museum of Romani Culture, and we have Publishing House, CARE, but situation between average Roma with language is very bad. They lost their language. But also we have, oh. I was going to say it's not as hard as Iceland. <laughs> 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 but we also have another big problem. I mean, that is the most biggest problem because those mother tongue teachers, they don't have any really school materials. They have to make their own compendium, sitting on their free time to make drawings and put the name on, uh, for example, a cow, we put the name on, under the cow and so on. Very simple things. But we have a school department. Uh, can we call it school department? It's Sophia? Board of Education. Yeah. And uh, as we are a national minority, they have they, uh, they had to make uh, school books for all the national minority, but they don't have any for Roma, not really yet. They made some small steps, but it wasn't good because uh, it was Roma from different groups who was making the, the those materials, and they had uh, their own spelling from their own country from the beginning. So in Sweden, it started for 10, 12 years ago, it started a Roma language council, where we decide that we are going to use this kind of orthography alphabet until we get something else from, from Europe or something. But uh, that alphabet we are using now, it's, it's okay. Some of the Roma in Sweden say, but this alphabet, we don't know anything because it's, it's the, uh, different characters from the Swedish one. Yes, it is, but this, those characters who are in, in, in this alphabet, you can use it in each, all the dialects because uh, the pronouncing is nearly the same. And we have the combination of a set and a D for J. And we have a C with a wing for J, and so on. S is a shape. 
So we don't use the German way to, to spell SH or SCH. Uh, and sometimes, you know, in Spain, for example, Adriana, uh, the, the, the character of J is different from, as I say it now, is, can you please say? J. It's Jota. Better. It's Jota. Jota doesn't sound like a J. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> um, I mean, that, that, that is the, the biggest problem. But now they start to, to do uh, something together with the Roma, and we are using the Roma alphabet. Because if you are wrong spelling, how should they, Roma children, know how to spell? Um. Sophia, I think, was going to bring up what do we do in emails on the computer. And what, what is kind of emerging automatically is, first of all, a sort of a dialect where you avoid words you know that they're not going to know. So you work around it. But um, between Christo and myself, we we try to avoid any accents on top. It's not perfect, but we use SH for SH, CH for CH, ZH for Z. Um, we, we still use a uh, letter C for TS, still use that, but we avoid any accents on top. It's not perfect. Some dialects have two kinds of R. So there's ere and then there's ere. Well, we put a double R because there are several European languages that use one R, two R. Spanish does because there are two R's. I think Albanian does and there's one or two others. Um, and you still don't need anything on an email to put on top. Right. It's not perfect, but it, it works for us because we know the language. Yes. Course, because those characters, they don't exist in a normal computer, a fair computer, because it, it is a, a Balkan, more Balkan mm -hmm. alphabet than it is a Swedish or English alphabet and so on. Mm. I'm sorry I took your time. No, not at all, please. On behalf of uh, the Wintus International Center, I thank all three of you for really making our evening and to this brilliant audience. Thank you so much and apologies for taking so much of your time. Thank you very much.